Hi right, guys. It is a fine Sunday morning here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here in the point lonesome swamp deep in the oasis of freedom here on another 80 degree December day. That would be Sunday, December 12th, 2021. This is the sound of the airboats. Anyone, anyone looking for the soundtrack of the collapse of a planet, the airboat, I highly suggest as one of the sounds of the collapse. But anyway, since it is Sunday, it is time for our weekly doomsday sermon, uh, which I think I have time to get in. I do want to put a note out that I've got a visitor coming. I don't know how long this visitor is going to stay. Uh, so there might not be another video for a few days. But anyways, we do have time for one more sermon. And I did something really, really radical yesterday. I actually went to the library. I went to the library for a Bible of the Apocalypse. And uh, this book I've actually referred to. I don't think I've ever done a sermon. We're going back to 2003. We're going to go back 18 years to hear what the doomsday prophets uh, were talking about, you know, and subsequently then completely ignored. And this is doomsday prophet Richard Ellis. Richard Ellis is a, uh, he's a, a journalist and an artist uh, <clears throat> whose main focus is on the oceans and marine life in his writing and his art and this was his uh, just straight to the point pretty much hopium free the empty ocean 18 years ago we were talking about the empty ocean and I assure you every single thing in the pages of this book this 300 page book are more true today than they were when uh richard ellis wrote this book so uh not exactly a spoiler alert instead of reading the introduction we're gonna go to the very end of the book this 300 page book and you need to go empty the uh oak trees of some squirrelies like that <clears throat> So uh, he wraps up, I'm glad to see in a, as I say, a fairly hopium-free ending uh, with his closing chapter, Is This the End? A fitting uh, title to the empty ocean. So is this the end? where he just kind of wraps up, uh, I guess, some leftover flotsam and jetsam. Um, and you can decide for yourself whether this, is this the end? And just think of all of the news that has come out in the past 18 years to add to this. So we are going to read the last four pages of is this the end of the empty ocean? Harvard Medical School's Center for Health and the Global Environment, the, Con the Consortium for Conservation Medicine, the Wildlife Trust, and the Environmental and Energy Study Institute presented a report to the United States Congress in May of 2001. 20 years ago in which they identified the decline of coastal habitats, they pointed out that residential, recreational, and commercial development have increased pressures on the marine coastal environment in addition to leaks, spills, and other accidents associated with oil extraction. We were just talking about that. Uh, and the Friday roundup, the combined panels testified 20 years ago, quote, 
We are witnessing the degradation of coastal marine habitat and excessive nutrient, chemical, and pathogen loading from farming, coastal development, animal and human waste, and the burning of fossil fuels, close quote. They identified sea otters that were dying from runoff of PCBs, marine birds exposed to marine pollution and chemical contaminants, and sea turtles threatened by a variety of environmental problems. Yes, they are. The sea turtles are getting it from like all ends. Um, they identified coral reefs as vulnerable to disease, quote, including several diseases that can harm humans. Perhaps they believed that identifying a threat to humans would make their report more meaningful to Congress, but it is obvious that no congressional body, I'm sorry, congressional panel by itself can halt the slide of coastal ecosystems into ecological despair. At a meeting in Brussels in June of 2002, European Union fisheries officials made arrangements that allowed Europeans to take more fish off the coast of the western African countries of Angola, Mauritania, and Senegal. Financial and environmental disagreements had caused an 18-month hiatus in the EU Senegal Fisheries Protocol, but most of Senegal's demands were accepted and EU fishing boats were set to haul in even greater <clears throat> tonnage than before. The same was true of Angola and Mauritania. Intensive fishing in African waters will be a disaster, particularly for the Africans. Having learned nothing from their experience in the Grand Banks, the Europeans will almost certainly fish out the African stocks, leaving the remainder to subsistence fishermen who obviously cannot give up their livelihoods. In an article published in New Scientist in July of 2002, Deborah McKenzie wrote, quote, the big worry now is that if the West African fisheries go the way of the Grand Banks, they will never come back, close quote. And of course, there is no mention of China uh, in, in here. So, uh, you know, obviously China has pushed aside the EU. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I don't know. I haven't gotten that far into the book. My guess is that the Chinese angle is probably not that developed in uh, a book from 18 years ago uh, because, you know, the Chinese were just cranking up uh, their global assault on the ocean. <clears throat> Not only have certain marine species been unable to escape the predations of fishermen's, fishermen, but humans have also introduced pathogens into the living body of the sea. We poison and infect mammals, birds, reptiles, and fishes with fatal contagious diseases. We have also introduced alien species that displace, replace, and sometimes eat the native species. We discharge our poisonous or radioactive effluents into the water, contaminating everything from lakes and streams to bodies the size of the Caspian Sea. No longer a haven for endangered species, the sea has become the next environmental battleground. 
When a panel was convened in late 1999 to testify before the U.S. Congress on the subject of endangered oceans and the corresponding threats to human health, Dr. Eric Shivion, director of Harvard Medical School's Center for Health and the Human Environment, said, quote, Oceans are endangered as perhaps never before. And there is mounting evidence that human activity may be, may be the culprit. Yes. Uh, <laughs> close quote. On the, on the subject of pollution, half a century earlier, a certain possum named Pogo had come to the same conclusion. We have met the enemy and he is us, close quote. I have uh, quoted Pogo the Possum many times uh, back uh, from the 1950s, I think. We have met the enemy and he is us. Anyway, okay, in 2001, the American Museum of Natural History published the Biodiversity Crisis to accompany the opening of a multi-million dollar Hall of Biodiversity, the book's editor, Michael Novacek, commented in the introduction, quote, Biodiversity is the spectacular variety of life on Earth and the essential interdependence of all living things. First formally used at a 1986 forum of researchers sponsored by the National Academy of Science, it has become the most commonly used word for scientists, conservationists, educators, and policymakers to describe a scientific discipline and an approach as well as a critical indeed life-threatening issue. We know that because we are losing biodiversity at an alarming rate. And uh, so of course it was right after that book came out that the UN, uh, was that their first biodiversity goals, or am I thinking of the 2010? Anyway, uh, ever since that book was written, virtually every single, every single one of the biodiversity goals, uh, you know, from the United Nations has been a complete and utter abject failure. <clears throat> uh, as the biodiversity crisis has uh, just, you know, exploded uh, since this book was written in 2003. <clears throat> no single region of the world has a corner on biodiversity loss. Although the tropical rainforests are often cited as the paradigm Immense as the rainforests are, however, they represent only a fraction of terrestrial habitats and an even smaller fraction of the Earth's livable space. By a substantial margin, the ocean is the largest biome on the planet. Something lives in almost every cubic inch of the ocean. Well, not counting uh, the dead zones, which uh, you know were discussed earlier in the book. And, and again, uh, I would like to compare the total number of dead zones that have uh, blanketed the, the ocean since this book was written. So not counting the dead zones, Something lives in almost every cubic inch of the ocean, and the seas contain about 326 million 
cubic miles of water. That's a lot of biodiversity. Ocean occupants range in size from microscopic diatoms to the great whales, the largest animals ever to have lived on the planet. Most of the creatures that inhabited that inhabit this gigantic watery realm breathe dissolved oxygen, breathe dissolved oxygen, not the O of HTO. The exceptions, minuscule in number but not in size, are the chemosynthetic hydrothermal vent animals, which do not rely on oxygen at all. That's a good thing. And the cetaceans and sirenians, which rely on the interface of air and water, extracting oxygen from the air just like all other mammals. All other ocean inhabitants, fishes, sharks, squids, octopi, cuttlefishes, clams, crabs, lobsters, gastropods, oysters, sea cucumbers, starfish, jellyfish, copepods, even corals, depend on dissolved oxygen for life. Everything that lives in the ocean is intimately connected with every other living thing by a complex arrangement of feeding strategies which can be simply expressed by changing fleas to fish in Jonathan Swift's little ditty. So naturalists observe a fish has smaller fish that on him prey, and these have fall smaller still to bite them, and so proceed ad infinitum. Fleas or fishes, the point is the same. Everything feeds on everything else, and it is not necessarily the bigger ones that eat the smaller. Very few ocean inhabitants can be classified as pure predators. Among them are probably the larger sharks and killer whales, but with those exceptions, virtually every animal that lives in the sea is vulnerable to predation by another animal at some stage in its life. <clears throat> the food chain often simplified to show the few larger species feeding on the plentiful smaller ones and so on ad infinitum is far more complex than that. <clears throat> Consider the life history of the codfish. He talks a whole lot about codfish and the collapse of the cod fishery. Consider the life history of the codfish. Each female lays millions of eggs, which float slowly upward, becoming part of the surface plankton. The hatchlings are provided with a pendulous yolk sac that provides nourishment for them and for any other creature that gobbles up these quarter-inch long larvae. Even at that length, cod are already predators, though they can prey only on planktonic creatures smaller than they are, such as the larvae of barnacle, shrimp, crabs, and little worms. Some inch-long cod take refuge in the tentacles of stinging jellyfish, uh, the cyana, evidently without being stung as they pick tiny parasites from the jellyfish. At about two months of age, the cod fry begin to look like miniature adults and they head toward the bottom where they will spend the rest of their lives. En route, they can be picked off by all sorts of midwater predators such as dogfish, sharks, and pollock, and even by larger codfish. So much for the simplicity of the food chain Prey and predator can be the same species if the size differential is sufficient. 
if they survive this sequential predation, codfish spend their lives within a fathom of the ocean bottom, feeding primarily on shellfish, but more than willing to eat anything that moves or doesn't move. Cod are infamous for gobbling up inanimate and inedible objects such as tin cans, shoes, pieces of wood, rocks, even a set of false teeth. By the age of two, cod can reach a foot in length and by three they are almost two feet long. A cod five feet long might be 40 years old, but there are no more five foot long cod and probably very few three footers. They have been mercilessly removed by the super predator who has bullied his way to the top rung of the food ladder and announced that the devil can take the hindmost. <clears throat> Our fishing out the cod from the North Atlantic upset the entire ecosystem and fostered imbalance in the trophic relationships that make up the food web. Prey animals ordinarily kept in check by traditional predators proliferate when those predators are removed. Even as the cod's disappearance spelled doom for the fishermen and the cod themselves, it wrought a special ecological havoc on the ecosystem of which the cod was an integral component. Thus are all natural systems integrated in ways we are only now beginning to understand. The assault on the fishes of the sea the slaughter of the sea otters, the displacement and extinction of the sea cows, the extirpation of the seals, the war against the whales, the drowning of the albatrosses, and the destruction of the world's coral reefs are all massive acts of violence against our Mother Ocean, she who gave us life and has sustained us so selflessly. In Poor Richard's Almanac in 1758, Benjamin Franklin wrote, quote, And again he adviseth to circumspection and care, even in the smallest matters, because sometimes a little neglect may breed great mischief, adding, for what of a nail the shoe was lost, for what of a shoe the horse was lost, and for what of a horse the rider was lost, being overtaken and slain by the enemy, all for want of care about a horseshoe nail. We are guilty of more than a little neglect and unless we begin exercising circumspection and care, we will surely lose the kingdom and all that goes with it. How poor we will be for its loss is beyond calculation. And then he wraps up this uh, book with this quote from John Donne from 1623. I uh, finally, I get to see the final context. Uh, you'll, uh, you'll recognize a couple of famous quotes. Uh, <clears throat> So we're going to close out the sermon with John Donne from 1623. Quote, Who casts not up his eye to the sun when it rises? 
But who takes off his eye from a comet when that breaks out? Who bends not his ear to any bell which upon any occasion rings? But who can remove it from that bell which is passing a piece of himself out of this world? No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Yep, yep, yep. And uh, amen. Oh, well, that was amen, Brother John Don. But amen, Brother Richard Ellis. And uh, let's do one more. That was the closing quote, but the opening quote that he chose for the empty ocean to close up this rant from Jeremy Jackson from his book, Historical Overfishing in the Recent Collapse of Coastal Ecosystems from 20 years ago. Quote, few modern ecological studies take into account the former natural abundance of large marine vertebrates. There are dozens of places in the Caribbean named after large sea turtles whose adult populations now number in the tens of thousands instead of the tens of millions a few centuries ago. Whales, manatees, dugongs, sea cows, monk seals, crocodiles, codfish, jewfish, swordfish, sharks, and rays are other large marine vertebrates that are now functionally or entirely extinct in most coastal ecosystems. Place names for oysters, pearl, and conchs conjure up other ecological ghosts of marine invertebrates that were once so abundant as to pose hazards to navigation, but are witnessed now only by massive garbage heaps of empty shells. Thank you, Jeremy Jackson. But anyway, guys, uh, and as I say, every word in this book, the empty ocean has been uh, amplified probably 20 times over in the last 18 years. Anyway, get out there and enjoy your empty ocean while you still can. And as I say, not sure what my schedule is gonna look like the next few days. So uh, it might be a few days or who knows. Till we meet again, for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Bye, guys.